This is the entire process of gene expression, starting out with transcription from the DNA and ending up with a degraded protein. So that's after the protein is already constructed and then used and no longer needed. So we've been talking about transcription and translation. And we now are going to discuss the steps that happen after translation. So over here, we are going to have a series of events or options that can happen to proteins, um, including activating or deactivating the protein, as well as degrading the protein and other types of modifications for proteins. So these are different possibilities that could happen to proteins after they are translated. Again, this is after the proteins are translated. The events that are occurring here are not determined by the same gene sequence that coded for the protein. So all of this is separate from that. Up at the top here, we have something called covalent modification. So the word that we might recognize is covalent. That's a type of bond that we've talked about since the beginning of the semester. Covalent bonds are those where atoms share electrons, so they are strong bonds. And when we talk about covalent modification, we are talking about the addition of some chemical group to a protein. This can include things like phosphate groups. So we've talked about phosphate groups a little bit previously, I think, when we talked about mitosis. So a phosphate group, it has a phosphate, has uh, oxygens, and it has an overall negative charge. And we can also talk about removing a phosphate group after it's added. As an alternative to this, another type of covalent modification is addition of sugar groups or carbohydrates. This is called glycosylation. And this, these can be added to specific proteins, just like the phosphate groups or the phosphorylation. They're not added to every single protein, but it's specific proteins that um, are destined or have the option to have these groups added. Now, phosphate groups, as we see here, are usually involved in either activating or deactivating a protein. It really depends on this particular protein you're talking about, whether or not the phosphate group is going to make it active. Um, and this is when we're talking about enzymes in particular, uh, most in most cases at least. So sometimes if you add the phosphate group, then this protein or this enzyme will become active. And then sometimes with other proteins, that will be the opposite. But for this particular protein, if we said it's active with the phosphate group, then if we remove the phosphate group, and then the phosphate group is just out here floating around on its own, then this protein will become inactive, or at least less active. And then these sugar groups, these carbohydrate groups, they are often used for identification of a protein and ultimately identification of a cell because many of these proteins actually tend to be released to the cell membrane, and we'll talk about that in a few weeks. And these include things like our ABO blood types. And the ABO is actually, uh, or all three of these are actually different groups of carbohydrates or different shapes of carbohydrates that are added to a protein and put in the membrane of the cell. All right, so let's move on to non-covalent modifications. And so an example of this is binding to other proteins. So here we see a CDK, or do you remember what that stands for? CDK, cyclin dependent kinase. And it is binding to its appropriate cyclin. And these are two proteins that we talked about in mitosis that um, signal that the cell is ready to move forward in the cell cycle. And CDK and cyclin participate in non-covalent binding because these two proteins don't um, have any atoms that exchange at electrons or share electrons, and they can bind and then they could disengage or uh, disassociate. And that is part of their function is to bind sometimes, but not other times. Now here with this specific uh, pair of proteins, the CDK also has this phosphate group. And so again, uh, we see that in the case of certain proteins, 
phosphate groups are going to make them active. And in this one in particular, the phosphate group um, allows the CDK to be bound by the cyclin. So those things all together make that protein active, uh, not just the phosphate group on its own, although the phosphate group is a necessary part of that whole kind of combination. And also just as an aside, again, CDK stands for cyclin dependent kinase. What is a kinase? A kinase is an enzyme that adds phosphate groups. So the phosphate group that is on this protein might have been added or most likely was added by a kinase. There are lots of different types of kinases, um, but they are all enzymes. And <clears throat> again, kinases will add a phosphate group and then phosphatases They are also enzymes, they do the opposite and they remove a phosphate group. All right, moving on now to the bottom here where we are looking at folding and cofactor binding. And this, oh, there we go. In folding and cofactor binding, we're talking about the protein being folded correctly because sometimes a protein is not folded correctly, especially depending on the environment and the cell. Um, and sometimes a cofactor is required for a protein to fold correctly. So the example of cofactors that we're probably most familiar with, cofactors and coenzymes are very similar, is that uh, are, sorry, are vitamins. And so things like um, magnesium, uh, calcium, things like that, they can act as cofactors or small molecules that will bind to a specific protein to help it um, correct its shape or get into the exact right configuration. And some proteins might bind or to these cofactors sometimes, and they might be functional even without the cofactor, but they'll be even more efficient with the cofactor. Whereas on the other hand, some proteins cannot function at all without their cofactor. And then finally, some proteins don't need a cofactor. And so this is a non-issue for them. For all of these options that we're seeing here, the covalent modification, non-covalent binding, uh, folder and cofactor binding, these are things that happen to only some proteins. Um, these are all things that you would have to know the exact protein uh, in order to know whether or not it's going to experience any of these. Uh, these modifications. Okay, um, and so let's talk a little bit more about protein folding for a moment before we go to the last option on the right side of the screen. And so well, we've talked a little bit about protein folding before and protein folding is really important because the shape of a protein is tightly connected to its function. If a protein is not the correct shape, it's not going to function correctly. And so this is a little video that shows the connection um, or the folding of a protein. Let me see, it's folding up. And what we're seeing here is a linear sequence or a linear polymer of amino acids. And they, depending on the sequence of amino acids, they're going to fold up into different shapes. But as we can see, this protein is pretty complicated in its shape. And so it takes a little bit more than just um, the sequence of amino acids for it to fold correctly. It needs the correct conditions in the cell. That includes things like the correct pH, the correct temperature range, um, and sometimes also the correct um, solutes or cofactors, as we mentioned. And if proteins don't fold correctly, then they might actually be degraded. Um, if they can't be fixed, then the cell is just gonna get rid of them. On the other hand, sometimes certain proteins, especially in certain cell types, can be refolded um, or assisted in their folding by some other proteins. <clears throat> so let's skip through this for now. Um, now, 
I wanted to talk about these heat shock proteins. You may have heard of these before. Um, sometimes they're called SHP or heat shock protein. And they help a protein go from a misfolded protein that's kind of a mess into a folded protein, which is an organized and functional protein or enzyme. And heat shock proteins, if you notice, they have a very specific shape, especially this one right here. And it's shaped a little bit like a barrel. And they actually refer to this uh, shape as a barrel shape. And interestingly, we could see that it also has a cavity in the middle, just like a barrel. And proteins will actually go into that cavity and that kind of isolates them so that then they could fold correctly. Um, so we see here that we have an unfolded protein and the protein actually goes into the um, inside of the cavity of the barrel, the heat shock 60 protein. And then we use a little bit of energy, we use ATP and we put the lid on the barrel and then the protein kind of just stays in there. And now it's protected from any other um, enzymes or other chemicals that might get in the way of it folding correctly. It's totally isolated. It gets like a little breather in the barrel. And then the ADP is released and then the protein comes out. Hopefully it's folded correctly. If it is, then this protein could go off and do its job. This is supposed to be smiley face. And then the heat shock protein will go and bind to the next unfolded protein. If the protein is not folded correctly, then it's going to be degraded. So this is just one type of heat shock protein. Another type of heat shock prote protein is, oh, <clears throat> um, is this type of heat shock protein. Um, they are smaller and they kind of just hold on to the protein as it's being translated. So this actually happens again during translation. So this is not necessarily a post translational modification. It's translational assistance more, I guess that's related to what we're talking about. So that's why I brought it up here. So this is again, another heat shock protein um, and it is going to bind to the amino acids in a protein so that then the entire protein can be translated before it begins to fold because maybe the beginning of this protein would associate with the um, part immediately after, but it's not supposed to do that. And so this whole thing is gonna be stopped from folding, prevented from folding until the rest of the protein is translated. And then maybe we'll have the front of the protein um, associate with the end of the protein there. And that's what is gonna cause it to fold correctly. This is just kind of, you know, a hypothetical situation here, um, but that's ultimately the goal of this type of heat shock protein. Heat shock 70 family uh, is to prevent premature folding of the protein. Okay, so one more thing. We talked about two different types of heat shock proteins. Why are they called heat shock proteins? So HSP, heat shock proteins. And they are called heat shock proteins in particular because proteins can become unfolded due to high temperatures. High temperatures can cause proteins um, to lose their shape because heat will destroy non-covalent bonds and it can destroy the hydrophobic um, hydrophilic arrangements so the hydrophobic parts of the protein or the hydrophobic amino acids are going to tend to be in the middle of the protein. The hydrophilic amino acids or parts of the protein are going to be tend to be on the outside. <clears throat> and when we put too much heat into the system, then all of this is going to get messed up and perhaps we're just going to have a protein that's unfolded and we don't necessarily have only the hydrophobic amino acids on the outside and the hydrophilic ones, or sorry, hydrophobic ones on the inside and hydrophilic on the outside. And again, um, something that might help with this is a heat shock protein. But 
heat shock is not going to degrade the proteins in, um, in terms of having the amino acids uh, themselves break apart. So the amino acids, the amino acid sequence, which is the primary structure of the protein is intact. And that's usually the type of heat that our proteins might experience. It's not going to be such high heat that our amino acids are going to start disassociating. It's just that our proteins are going to become um, a little bit um, misshapen. And we also talked a little bit about how certain proteins can help themselves to refold. And in particular, these are things, or these are proteins that have a lot of um, amino acids that can form disulfide bonds. And so most amino acids do not do that, but certain specific amino acids do. And we see all of these sulfurs in these R groups on this protein. Each one of these sulfurs is from a, an amino acid, an amino acid residue in this chain. And this, uh, these sulfurs can spontaneously form disulfide bonds because they're really good at binding to one another. And you can see when these disulfide bonds form, then they help the rest of the protein to be in the right shape. All right, so finally, we have not talked about this um, post-translational modification, which is really the end of a protein's life. Uh, whether it was never folded correctly and it's going to be disposed of, or if it was folded correctly and performed its function and is now damaged or just no longer needed in the current situation in the cell, proteins are degraded in something called a proteasome. Um, and so a proteasome, which is here, is a protein that degrades other proteins. So really it's a complex of enzymes that degrades other proteins. So this is our target protein we see here, and it's actually quite small compared to the proteasome because the proteasome is um, a complex of proteins. It's pretty large. And the only reason why uh, the cell would send a certain protein to the proteasome is if it has these particular tags on it. So these tags are just a certain chemical um, this is called a polyubiquitin chain, and the polyubiquitin chain means send to the dump or send to be destroyed. And that is what happens at the proteasome. So in order to start being degraded, a protein has to have these because the proteasome is going to bind to the, this polyubiquitin chain. Otherwise, if the ubiquitin is not there, then the protein won't be bound by the proteasome and it's safe, it's not gonna be degraded. The middle of the proteasome has these enzymes called proteases, and that's what's going to do most of the work. So you kind of feed the protein through the proteasome, as we see here, we had the binding of the ubiquitin, very important. Um, and then the protein goes to the middle of the proteasome and the amino acids are removed one at a time. And each one of these is a single amino acid and those amino acids can be used again. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not modified in any way. They are going to be used by the ribosome to build some other protein that is currently needed. And I wanted to point out here that the central part of the proteasome is made up of what we call proteases. Now proteases, these are just generally any kind of enzyme that can um, break down a protein. So protease is an enzyme that breaks what kind of bonds? If it's removing amino acids from a protein, then what type of bond does it break? it breaks peptide bonds. Again, proteases break peptide bonds. These particular proteases in the proteasome break peptide bonds in this specific way, where they're releasing one amino acid at a time. <clears throat> 
some other proteases will release a couple of amino acids at the same time. So you might have like an alanine uh, bound to a tryptophan and then a serine bound to a glycine, et cetera. So anyway, my point here was that some proteases are going to release um, not single amino acids, but short strings of amino acids, whereas other proteases or a group of proteases as within this proteasome is going to release individual amino acids. They're really great for being recycled and used again. So I think that uh, covers everything in our post-translational modification